My name is Sandy Bierwitz Seusel. I work for Hellaba Invest. Um, I've held um, various investment management roles over the last 10 years, and what I'm uh, currently doing is um, advising clients on real estate investments and providing a fund of fund solutions for them. Great, thanks. Marcia. Hi, I'm Marcia Sles. I'm uh, in this moment uh, especially uh, representing uh, RSM but I'm in real estate, we just counted it, <laughs> 26 years, and I have two own companies. One is in marketing and communication, and the other one is investment consultancy. Great, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Julie. Hello, my name is Julie Fitzsimmons, uh, and my company, Lodestar, is a strategic uh, marketing company, and we work internationally, um, and we are uh, aiming to give people direction, help people find direction, and then help them turn thought into action, do something with it. Um, and uh, we were just also discussing that we've been uh, meeting here for 15, 16 years, we think. So uh, uh, it's nice to be here. <laughs> Great. And Judith. Good morning, everybody. My name is Judith Gabler. I've been working for RICS for the past 25 years. I'm based in Frankfurt. Uh, my responsibilities have been to develop the profession on behalf of the RICS in Germany, and I've more recently taken on a pan-European role. So for those of you who may not know RICS, we are a public interest body, and our aim is to create confidence in the markets and to pr promote thought leadership, which is why diversity and gender diversity is is a very important topic for us. Great, thank you. Um, so first of all, what I, what I wanted to do was really, um, in terms of the big picture, which we have here, is just pick up some of the trends that, that you're seeing in the market. Um, I'll feed in some that also I've been seeing, particularly here in terms of the, the sort of 15 discussions that I've moderated while I've been here, pick up on some of those trends. But Sandy, just in terms of the, uh, I suppose, the industry market from yours and a Hellebor Invest perspective, what are you seeing at the moment? Um, we see a lot of uh, very specialized investment strategies given the market um, environment as a, uh, as a whole. It's becoming more and more challenging for investors to find investment opportunities. So then our clients, which are basically come from, uh, which are basically institutional investors and uh, pension funds um, we are advising, um, we have to uh, provide very, very specialized investment strategies so we work very, very close with asset managers who know their field very, very well, who are um, in certain markets and can, can drive niche strategies and are very, speci very specialized um, to, to basically provide hands-on asset management and respective investment returns. Um, and in terms of the sort of ESG side in, in general, is that becoming a more important part, do you think, of, of the decision making within the group? Absolutely, it is. Um, a lot of our clients are asking for um, ESG uh, criteria and investment solutions, also funds uh, which are specially focused on, on these um, investment types. So it's a definitely a very big topic. Okay, good. Um, uh, and Marsha, you've obviously been um, working for a long period of time in the industry and coming from different perspectives, having also worked at Multi in the, in the retail development side, um, and as well as communications, as well as doing investing as well. Um, are there any particular kind of takeaways from, from this expo or changes in the market that you've especially been seeing? Yes, uh, what I've uh, noticed is that... Uh, some years ago, we were talking a lot about the new markets. Uh, at that moment, Central Europe was, for instance, a very uh, new market. Um, what, we, what I see at this fair is that Central Europe and Southern Europe are becoming, uh, are becoming better, so to say. You know, there's more business to be done there. And uh, in general, I see that cross-border business in real estate is really uh, picking up. I also noticed that as my role within uh, RSM as a program manager for the uh, European real estate uh, desk, so to say. Um, so we, in, within our group, we noticed that very, very well. What I always uh, see in the reports, which have been published by, well, let's say the, the, the well-known brokers everywhere, that there's also a lot of change in investing in terms of uh, residential offices, logistics, healthcare, which is also really popping up uh, in a lot of uh, countries. Um, 
So I do think that we are still in, let's call it an upswing of the market. Although I think that everybody who has been at the crisis time also in this line of business is keeping uh, their feet on the ground and saying, okay, let's make wise decisions now and not go into the modus which we had uh, uh, yeah, at that time. Okay, good. Um, and certainly that residential, everything in terms of the piece through from student housing, well, nurseries through student housing, through micro-living, co-living, uh, ordinary PRS, and through into senior living, assisted living, care and health care have been a much, much bigger topic here um, than they've ever been before. Um, we did our first dedicated one on health care at, at MIPIM if I'm allowed to mention MIPIM while I'm here. <laughs> um, and I've done, I think, three sessions since then and have done, in, in total, over, over September, we did five sessions all around that sort of life cycle, what's in the UK called cradle to grave, rather miserably. <laughs> um, th those sessions, are be you know, that's becoming a much, much bigger thing. Um, mm. I, I was particularly keen, because it's very rare on, on panels, for example, and especially panels that we do, that we have people who are also involved in communications, but also from the associations. And I think it's a really important view to, to share. Um, Julie, you've obviously been in, in communications a lot of the time in the, in the retail sector. You'll have seen big changes there. But from a communications and, and sort of marketing point of view, um, how are you seeing the changes? Are there things that you've particularly seen at Expo Real this year and that you think are interesting? And also, I'd, I'd like to get your take on on retail, especially having seen it go through a number of different phases. Thank you. I, in the context of retail, I just think this is a really interesting time for retail. It's obviously incredibly challenging. Um, I think though that um, going back to the point about what are we seeing that's changing, what's changing is that we, at the moment, we don't, we're not experts anymore. We, I think people used to be experts in their area. We were experts in offices, we were experts in residential. So actually what's happening is a lot of these things are starting to merge across. So we're having assets that have either got some real specialisms or we have some assets that are uh, having much more mixed uses um, than we would have seen in the past. And certainly in the context of retail, um, the the Obviously, we all know about the impact of online. It's not, this is not rocket science. It, online is a march forward. It's happening everywhere at different paces. Um, but the growth is there in every market. Um, so we are going to need to adapt uh, the retail assets. Um, and the retail assets are changing. We're seeing people like Inca, who are now, they're not calling themselves shopping centers. They're calling themselves meat. Me meet, um, meet meeting, meeting places. Meeting places. So they're they're calling meeting places. Much more emphasis now. I think. That I, in fact, they've changed the name of their shopping centre managers to meeting place managers, um, and they are. Yeah, this is it. And um, you know, but we're also seeing situations in um, Central Eastern Europe. I think had been protected from this drive for a while. Actually, the thing that's pushing this in, in their region is um, uh, some of the big hypermarkets that are halving in scale. Um, they're either leaving or they're halving in size. And they're, they're massive anchor tenants. And they're going to have to, re there's a lot of work now to try and think about quite quickly how they're going to reuse that space um, and re engineer what was an anchor tenant, seeing a lot of leisure going into that environment. The problem with the leisure is there isn't enough operators, um, and there certainly are not operators in CE. Um, in fact, they're not in Germany too. Um, so there's a lot of pressure around that. There's a lot of pressure around F&B <laughs> um, and having footfall for F&B. Um, so there's ideas about leisure, being able to drive that footfall for F&B. But the, the challenge with all of this is that actually we're not experts in any of this anymore. So we're all having to learn, and this is why these sort of sessions, I think, are great, because why you see a lot more people coming to Expo to learn as well as to trade. So I think that that's as much about when we're getting out of the office as, uh, as it has been. Good. Um, uh, and Judith, obviously, from the RICS's point of view, um, <coughs> Obviously, you're, you're looking at transparency, you're looking at regulation, you're looking at uh, all of these aspects. Um, how important in terms of um, 
your role, I suppose, and the and the role of the RICS is ESG as a, I guess, as a driver. And is that coming from the market? Is that coming from you? Is it coming um, from the membership? Mm. Um, I, I think we take a very holistic approach, and and so it's a very important part of our. our communication our mission on the markets and if I take a step back um, in 2014 we did considerable research our futures report our changing world let's be ready and we I interviewed and sat down round tables with many hundreds of people across the globe to try and identify what are the topics which are going to change the future and even now in the space of time since the past five years we can see that the momentum is is increasing in the importance of some of those topics. Topics like uh, mass urbanization, sustainability, climate change. Um, six billion people will be living in cities by 2015. So the demand for people to be able to cope with the changes that we're all going to be faced is growing and growing. So we need to look at the supply of people. And clearly, what emerged from the report, one the three recommendations, is that for us as a professional body, we need to take a leadership role in acting as a conduit for uh, companies, whether it's in Europe or whether it's in Germany, whether it's globally, in order to bring people together to find solutions. And this is why diversity, gender diversity, um, why um, young, the, the war for talents is such an important topic for us because we have to understand how can we meet the demand of the markets in order to face the challenge of some of these uh, huge global problems. Um, so this, this is what we have been doing for the past five years in trying to um, enhance our position, working with others to understand and creating more diversity, both inside our own organization, but also on the markets. And it's quite interesting because often the discussion around diversity um, is, is just a, a purely a discussion around gender diversity. Um, but actually, from, from the RICS's point of view, how do you see that? Um, is, it, is it more about general diversity in terms of not blocking access to talented people um, from the industry generally? I mean, we cover the whole range of diversity. Um, so we look at sexuality, we look at the re religion, we look at the impact on social backgrounds. So we t look at very holistic, the, the diversity spectrum. But because of uh, access to information and also because of the impact of cultures in different markets, what can you say, what can you not say, then we do tend to focus on gender diversity. So we've been doing various things internally inside our own organization organization in order to create awareness um, for diversity. We had a, um, a campaign about three years ago which we called uh, Dare to Share. So we encouraged all our employees to do brief video messages explaining how they were different. So the difference might be that somebody was a, a gay person or a lesbian person or that somebody had a disability. But by opening it up and creating that transparency within the company, we managed to create a different kind of acceptance for differences. And I think this is what gender diversity, as well as the whole diversity, is about acceptance, breaking down barriers and creating that transparency. Um, and it's quite interesting. So I, I, um, I had a panel with Core Estate um, yesterday um, evening at sort of four o'clock, five o'clock. Um, and that was talking about... Um, Particularly, they were that because they'd started to do, partly because the institutional capital was demanding it, um, for it not to just simply be greenwashing, or mm. um, that actually you'd got to take a serious strategic approach to ESG generally, um, and that included them also their carbon footprint, also setting goals, um, and one of them especially um, was gender in terms of senior positions within the board. Um, because what they'd realized when they'd done the analysis, and this is the point I want to, to come to in a way, is that because they'd made a strategic decision, they therefore made a strategic decision to also have a, an ESG report, which meant that they actually then looked for, really for the first time almost at their own business and could see that although they'd got a significant amount of diversity at a certain level in the company, 
it actually stopped at the board, pretty much. Um, and so therefore they'd set an agenda um, to do that, mainly from their position, which was that what they wanted to do was actually to get a diverse view into their board because they felt that would make better investment decisions and more sustainable investment decisions. Um, I, I'm just wondering, in, f from anybody really, in, d do you think that sort of transparency reporting um, is actually going to help highlight some of these things and elicit change? Uh, may I comment on that? You, yes. Anybody can. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, um, I think that uh, uh, the uh, basis point in thinking, uh, at least that's my experience, um, that in fact it's about who's best for the job. Um, if it's a man or a woman, uh, in my humble opinion, that doesn't matter. The right person for the right job. Besides that, you have also the uh, uh, simple fact that women are the only ones who can bear children. Um, so that means automatically that you have to make choices. And I was going to say, although we are in the innovation <laughs> room, so who knows? <laughs> <I mean. laughs> well, that would be the topic of the expo <laughs> this year. <laughs> no, but I really think that um, although I'm, of course, I'm, I'm uh, a big in favor of uh, women in the right and, uh, if possible, higher positions, depending on their background, depending on their knowledge, uh, depending simply on what they can do. But day-to-day -day life is simple. You can't demand from a company that because you have this in your uh, system that you want children at a certain moment, you want to work full time. Yeah, that means that you have to make choices and you have to arrange a lot of stuff yourself. And there are apparently quite a lot of women in high uh, positions who have achieved this. Uh, Bar I don't know if you know Barbara Knoflach. I do. Really an icon. And I remember that wh I was in a, a real estate uh, seminar in Frankfurt. She was pregnant like this, sitting on the podium. And she also said, yeah, you know, this is my choice. I'm, I'm due to have my baby in a week, but I'm here because I believe in what I do. I've arranged everything and, and you know, that's it. So I think that uh, if you look at in the Netherlands, uh, now there's a whole discussion about um, uh, uh, diversity in the uh, listed companies. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure if you push it through, if it will have the uh, effect we all support, but are we going to get there in this way? That's, that's my question. I think that the transparency debate is, is, is important here because majority of companies now are using something like GRI uh, in, in terms of indicators um, and, and through that we're all starting to measure and to report and to be transparent uh, and what this is doing is highlighting a number of things where actually we're not very comfortable um, and so um, it, it is through some of these indicators that actually some of these topics are becoming much more open and we're now having a chance to take action. But I think also it's about having a discussion within the business. I don't think, w what used to happen I think is that corporate reports were very much about corporate reporting at a level in the business. Actually, to make them real, a lot of these indicators are really about how you manage your business. So they create opportunities for you to manage things within the business and make changes and to have that dialogue in businesses. And that's where really corporate reporting is, is at its best, mm. where actually it, you, it allows you to have that conversation in the business about what you want. It doesn't mean that you have to be the same as everybody. You may say that's, we're gonna, you know, th this indicator, we're happy with this at this level. And that, that can be at any level. You'll have some that are regulated like, uh, like, like carbon, mm. you know, where you're gonna have to hit that but you'll have some that you make decisions about. And I think diversity mm. is one of those. It's one of them, you, you yeah. Can, you're going to have to report on it, but then it's up to you as to what kind of company you want to be. And that's about having that dialogue within your businesses. Yeah. Do you want to pick that up? Um, yes. <laughs> um, I would like uh, to add something to Marsha's point. I 100% um, mm. agree with you. Oh, it's, about, nice. <laughs> um, it's about making choices. But what I have found is that there's a lot more, a, a lot of awareness within companies. And um, it's much easier today to arrange um, 
flexibility within teams and and for people. I mean, I have uh, I have two little children and um, I muddled my way through with uh, home office solutions mm. and um, I have fantastic employers who uh, provide me with a lot of um, flexibility. But to my mind, this doesn't necessarily have to do much with men and women. No. We all uh, work in environments, especially if in my case, and I'm working in a transactional business. There's always a lot to do. There's a lot of interaction. There's many people to be, to be, uh, to be organized. But it's um, not. It's not. It's not only. Um, yeah, it's just challenging you have to be flexible you have you demand to be agile you have to you have to walk um, the extra mile but I have uh, found having a, a team and um, and having um, an open environment where you can also demand this flexibility mm -hmm. that um, if it's not very busy it's also okay to leave yeah. the office at um, uh, at, uh, at, at, at lunchtime yeah then um, it's much easier and it's um, I have, for example, I had a fantastic colleague working working for me um, in the in the transaction side. He was nursing his his sick mother at home, mm -hmm. and uh, he told me one day, "See, I can take on certain tasks, um, but I have to leave at I don't know five o'clock to pick her up for mm -hmm. for this and this." And we uh, found a solution for him how so that it worked for him and also for, for the company. team as a whole. Um, to, to accommodate his needs. So it, it's not always about women and children. Yeah, it's, exactly. it's about everyone. Everyone is demanded to be yeah. flexible. And I have, I have realized um, giving people this flexibility actually creates a lot of trust and um, a lot of um, openness. Um, and many people walk the extra mile if they know, yes, um, my, my boss or my company is, is helping me as well with flexibility. Mm. Um, if, if I'm in need. So, so I think this is actually um, the more practical side of it. It's, act it's in people's heads. Yeah. It's not an agenda. So it's not written anywhere. It's that people act differently. That people actually start things. How can we create work environments for, for everyone yeah. um, so that they can be result driven, focus on the, on, on the company's needs, but also be able to manage their personal lives? And th that's quite interesting because, in a way, that picks up the that that point around well-being, health, um, how how companies operate, and that flexibility. And maybe that actually is going to be one of the key drivers that it's actually coming from another part of the ESG topic, um, in a way which is driving that because people are looking for more flexibility. Buildings are going to have to be well certified, but also lifestyle health of workers is also becoming something that's very a very big part of that agenda. Um, is that also part of the w what you're looking at in terms of the RICS? Yeah. I'd just like to reaffirm both what Marcia and um, Sandy have said about the flexibility. Um, and I think it's also, in, in your example, Marcia, that's great visibility. And it's also mm. about raising visibility for women who have succeeded in overcoming certain barriers. So I thought that was a great example. And to pick up on what you said, Sandy, um, RSCS did a poll last year among its female chartered surveyors, and the, top, the number one priority of, I think, 45% of the women was flexible working. Because when you're young, you have your children, but believe me, as you go through the life cycle, at some stage you may have parents or sickly relatives, and so that you're still mm -hmm. faced with that problem, how do you balance your workload? Mm -hmm. you know, somebody like me, uh, originally it came from England, my parents were in England working in Germany, how do you look after them when they get sickly? So I think flexibility is absolutely key to doing that. And what we did last year in, uh, at RICS, um, because we want to influence others to do the same and to have inclusive policies, is that in our uh, assessment programme, so when we train and assess people to become chartered surveyors, we introduced a new 
competency, well, two new competencies. One was diversity and inclusion, so to raise awareness about diversity so that when people present themselves for assessment, they're actually tested on their knowledge of the importance of diversity inclusion. And the second competency, and these are mandatory, so people have to know about these if they wish to qualify as chartered surveyors, is about creating inclusive workspaces. So as you said, which is about breaking down barriers. How do people get to work? How do they physically work? How do, if they have a disability, what is their workspace like? So about space and design. And we've introduced that now. So every new entrant to the profession globally now has to demonstrate for RICS a, a basic core understanding of the principles of diversity and inclusion. So this is how we are trying to influence the profession. It's not happening immediately, but as we move forward in years, then we hope it will make that difference. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, and uh, Julia, just in, uh, just in, in your sort of view, um, are you seeing um, it becoming a more important thing in terms of people's communication? that actually this is then, because, because people are now having to compete for talent, I mean, you see it from cities, but you see it also in companies that actually making sure that you are the city or you are the company that attracts the best talent. And that, of course, means that you're having to adjust um, both the types of real estate, but also the company approach for different generations coming into the work side. Do you, do you think these criteria, whether that's wellness, whether that's diversity in all its forms um, is also about attracting the right talent both into this industry but also more generally. Well, I think that's absolutely correct. Um, I think what we're seeing is um, um, uh, our generations that are coming through now are looking at companies in a quite a different way. It's not just about a, a straight career progression it's as much about my working environment, um, about um, the policies. So the uh, one of the, um, uh, the the pages on your website, which will get the most hits in recruitment, will be um, your sustainability policy. Um, it is the first place that um, uh, people this generation, that look yeah. when they are going into your website to look at it in terms of recruitment. They will go to that that page first. Um, and uh, that is before they even get to the about page. Um, so, so they go to that page first um, and they spend most time in that area. Um, and so yes, it is very much about talent. Um, and, uh, but I think taking that point on, I think that it's also about we're designing for people who are of all sorts of people, we, we know for, di for people who are disabled, have different, uh, you know, um, sexual orientations, etc. We're designing for all sorts of people. Um, uh, and, and I think that we need to therefore be a diverse sector so that we can have that, have first-hand influence. We can't really design, I can't really design for a disabled person on my own and just make it up as I go along. You know, I have to have that input one way or the other. And I, and I believe that, that by bringing more people into our sector of different, um, uh, different types and styles and more diverse sector, we will have a more rich environment and more successful uh, sector. Mm. And uh, I mean, it's quite interesting because yeah. if you look around Expo Real, um, it's very, it's actually quite diverse. Um, in a way, I know there's a lot of people around my age, slightly overweight, uh, with, <laughs> with a blue suit on. I'm aware of that. <laughs> um, but uh, but by next year, I'll, I'll wear a grey suit. I'll do something different. Um, but it's interesting when so when we're doing travels to different areas, for example, so. Um, when we did the session in, in China, uh, it was very diverse. And also going to Poland, for example, very diverse, both in terms of leadership roles, also the speakers that are on the panels. Um, it, in general, it was, it's, it's a much easier thing to do. And also partly as a representative of the media here, we're also, um, because I think the point that you made there, Judith, about earlier about representation, mm -hmm. Rather like um, you know we saw on uh, TV and in media, where actually 
different, you know, getting diversity into representation on television just meant that it was it began to be normalized in a way that then people didn't think, oh, well, actually, this isn't for me. And I think that's an interesting thing about the real estate market is, is if we want to attract the talent, it's also got to be representative. So people have to look at it and say, I can see myself working in that industry. And also in terms of the, the from our point of view, we're led partly by the communication side, who they're suggesting as speakers and who they're suggesting as their spokespeople. And so what I would say also for the industry is is think about that as well in terms of diversity and who you're putting forward. Um, just because, again, I think it helps representation and helps people see themselves in the industry. Um, uh, I wanted to underline what Sandy said about the employers giving you flexibility um, and you give them back like uh, more com more passionate work or more yeah it's a really it's a two-way thing and um, I'm working for the RICS I was ill for a very long time but they supported me a lot my boss my, my colleagues I could do um, half day working I could do home office and then I got back to health and I think uh, yeah I was so I felt so much supported so um, I'm working more than ever, so <laughs> <laughs> I wanted just to underline what Sandy said. That's very important to give your employees flexibility. You will get back a lot. Yeah, that is. Can I make a point about flexibility? I think it's um, we've um, been going through um, some changes with our team, and um, one of the things that has been happily happening is that we are starting to have people who are returning after being uh, being away from the workplace for quite a long time to look after children. So they had several children, and the way in which their life and work was, they, they decided to stay at home. Really talented people. Um, and now they're coming back after maybe six years. Yeah, six, seven years. Yeah, so that's a big gap. Things have really changed. That's really hard to find a job that you can hold down, that you can actually do, effectively it's quite hard to come back um, and so we have been um, uh, working with people who are coming back to work um, and uh, generally speaking they also like to work at home um, some of the time um, and it just makes t picking the children up easier and all of these kind of practicalities and so we we do that I just work with them and say well what works for you okay let's do that I think we can we can do some of this. I'm a smaller company, so you know we're only ten people, so we can we can be very flexible. But I think you know larger companies should be able to think about that and and work some flexibility out. But I think that there are groups. The other groups that, that I think are interesting, which are not about women, it's about everybody, and that is mental health. Um, and I think that coming back after to to a company after you've had a mental health break is very hard um, and, yet, and there is talent there that's also had a break and that's a very difficult step back into work um, but we know that mental health I don't know the numbers on mental health but it's enormous isn't yeah. it um, more than you and think it's much more than you think um, but it is very difficult to step back in um, uh, and I know this from experience my husband had a very difficult um, time it's very very difficult in, he was in the corporate world and and it's very, very difficult step back in. And I think diversity and, and, our, and flexibility, because of all the discussions we've been having about gender, it's starting to open up lots of opportunity in other Opening areas. The doors. Yeah. So there's opportunities for men here too, <laughs> because you know it, it, we're starting to think about other things at the same time. And I, th I think that's true. And I think innovation. Tech, you know, what, what, uh, let's say ten years ago. We were having lots of lots of discussions about the possible, like like there've been very negative things about retail. There were actually similar negative things about office at the time, mm. which was that broadband innovation would mean the end of offices because yeah. everybody would work from home. Actually, that hasn't happened. But interestingly, I think that mm. that point's relevant. That it's introduced the flexibility yes. for people to be able mm -hmm. to work from home. And I think the point is absolutely right, Judith, that, that it's uh, th this is a 
flexibility for everybody mm. because you will have to care ultimately for elderly parents who may have dementia or may have something else. You will have to. There are other things that everybody will have to do because gradually roles are also changing, I think, mm. in terms of, it, you, know, you know, you will, everybody will have parents probably that will get old <laughs> at <laughs> some point. Um, are there any other... Um, I'm going to pick on you for a second, Paula, and I know I shouldn't, but um, I can see you're from the U.S. Department of State. Yeah. Um, just if in the U.S., because often these things um, drive quicker in the U.S. in a way, what, what's, happening, what's happening there in terms of this whole kind of diversity aspect? You don't need to be an expert, but I'm just, uh, just, <laughs> just really interesting to get your view. Yeah. Well, you have... Well, well, this is actually our first time at Expo at the Department of State, and there's a strong contingent oh. of colleagues here. Wave your hands, please. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, no, you see, among us, there's a very diverse <laughs> room. Um, I think, speaking narrowly about the Department of State, I mean, it's a very diverse workforce. There's promotion of um, women, obviously, ethnicity, mm. sexual orientation, and the like. So it, and it's one of those things that I think in recruitment is very, very important. Um, and it, from all respects, in terms of bringing a new perspective into, and, and our group here is entirely focused on planning and real estate, um, but Department of State as a whole is a, is a massive organization, um, and I, I would say on the policy side, it's always being promoted. Mm. Um, so I, I think we're very proud that we're always on the leading trend of, of those diversity policies. Mm. So, yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> Richard, and sorry. Yes. May I come back because you were talking about uh, health, uh, mm -hmm. mental issues. Uh, uh, there's also a, a picking back on the health issue and the well-being and how it relates to real estate, uh, to step back to, let's say, our core business. Uh, there's an institution called the Blue Building Institute. And uh, it's, it's a platform where especially health and well-being in the built environment, so that means in the offices, in our residential environment, even into logistics, etc., is really a very important part of the real estate proposal because you can translate it back, you know, in your in your uh, in your yield, in fact, in the end for the investor. But the key thing is, is that they do a lot of activities to monitor how is the environment applicable on health and well-being. You can get a certification for that, so then you get a well health Sorry, well hold building. certificate, yeah. which means your office with all the flexibility also in the practical side for daycare and have a green park around it, uh, a fitness club, or whatever you need. Uh, so really try to um, promote the health and well-being because what you say, you know, there's a lot of stress and a lot of mental issues if you look in the numbers of employees and to attract the young professionals yeah. because indeed they have another point of view on the market and how they want to participate in real estate than we had 20, 25 years ago. For them, what you mentioned, you know, what do they click first on the website, the sustainability mm. report or the corporate uh, governance report, stuff like that. That's, you know, a hot topic with the young generation. And then you create automatically this flexibility which you have in your exactly. team. And, you know, then the thing starts rolling. And then you have uh, Rick, so to say, with the data, you know. The, the, yeah, so then it comes all together. Well, I think it was, it's, it, what, what has been interesting in most of the discussions we've had as well is that um, it's, it comes down to the bottom line of all of these things are actually also about driving out performance. Yeah. Because therefore, if you have the right talent, if you can retain the right talent, if mm -hmm. you're making the best investment decisions, you will get the best returns. Yeah. Um, and that it's about outperformance to a degree, which I think then makes the argument much more convincing.